pleasure to introduce Professor Gal Richter Levin today. Professor Richter Levin is currently the head of the Haifa Forum for Brain and Behavior and co-director of the Institute for the Study of Affective Neuroscience at the University of Haifa. He earned his PhD in 1992 at the Weizmann Institute and after a two-year postdoc joined, joined the University of Haifa. Since 2006, he is a full professor at the Department of Neurobiology and the Department of Psychology. In 2009, he was nominated the Dean of the Natural Sciences Faculty. Uh, combining behavioral, electrophysiological, and biochemical approaches, Professor Victor Levine's research examines the role of emotional and amygdala activation in memory formation and the effect of stressful experiences in early life and cognitive and emotional abilities uh, in adulthood. He has published over 100 scientific papers and has supervised over 50 graduate students. Thank you. On my way here, uh, actually came to my mind that I'm actually a graduate of this university, although in agriculture. Um, uh, but I yeah, shifted a bit from agriculture to... <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, stress and amygdala modulation of plasticity in the hippocampus. Um, and on the effects... Thank you. The effects of stress on uh, on uh, learning and memory in relation to post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, and the classical view of the effects of stress on uh, neuroplasticity in the hippocampus and on the campus-dependent uh, learning and memory is that the exposure to stress suppresses the ability to induce LTP and impairs uh, hippocampus-dependent learning, and it is also been suggested that at least part of the effects of uh, stress on the uh, hippocampus are mediated by the activation by stress of the uh, amygdala, which then influences uh, the uh, hippocampus. That stress activates the amygdala has been shown by many laboratories, <coughs> uh, both in uh, human studies and in animals, this is an example from a study where they showed that the exposure uh, of, of people to, to more emotional pictures uh, activates the amygdala as a correlation. There's a correlation with the rate of emotionality of these pictures and the activation of the amygdala. And there's a correlation between the memory of those uh, pictures with the activation of the amygdala suggesting that the activation of the amygdala is somehow involved, actually, not in impairment of memory, but actually in enhancement of, of emotional memory. And uh, I will touch upon this duality of the of effect. What is the rating there? The rating is that uh, the, these, these uh, pictures were rated by, by, uh, by uh, many so people. So for me, for me, the Twitter is not so emotional. I think that uh, when you go into this area, you would find that individually, for different people, some pe pictures may be more emotional or less emotional, but here, rating over a, a large number of people, you get pictures that are more likely to induce an emotional response of people. So, many people would claim that this is an emotional uh, uh, picture, but uh, sometimes if you show a picture of a dog which is supposed to be maybe a naive picture and someone just had his dog uh, run down by a car, yeah. it will be an emotional picture. This was my question. Yeah, exactly. So, so per person, per picture, it's meaningless. Okay? But uh, overall it is the... Does uh, that include the depressed people? No, the depressed people have biases. <laughs> 
uh, uh, and uh, part of this is uh, in the level of activation of the, uh, of the uh, amygdala. Unfortunately, this is also in very individual and not at the diagnostic level. Um, that we also found in, uh, in uh, animals, just as has been shown by many other laboratories, that exposure of animals to stress activates uh, the amygdala. This has been shown in different ways. In this case, we measure the response of the basal amygdala to stimulation of the entorhinal cortex following the exposure Following the exposure to elevated uh, platform stress, you can see that the response of the amygdala is, uh, is uh, increased. And if you think that stress activates the amygdala and the amygdala somehow affects the hippocampus, then you would expect that activating the, uh, the amygdala by stress would affect learning mechanisms in the hippocampus, but these studies do not show it directly. And in order to try and test this uh, directly, we used uh, electrophysiological uh, uh, methods recording in field potentials in, uh, in vivo, in, uh, in anesthetized uh, rats, where we could try to induce long-term potentiation as, as, a, as a measure of plasticity and asking whether priming the amygdala prior to the attempt to induce uh, LTP in the hippocampus would affect our ability to induce LTP in the hippocampus. And indeed we found that if you prime the amygdala or if you stimulate it immediately after high frequency stimulation uh, to the pathways into the hippocampus, you would get a suppression of LTP just as has been reported by many laboratories for the effects of stress on LTP in the, in the hippocampus. However, if you pay more attention to the details, it turns out that those studies that talk about suppression of LTP in the hippocampus actually talk about C1 area of the hippocampus because most of these studies uh, introduced the stress and then prepared slices and recorded in a slice preparation and in try to induce LTP in the CA1 and then you see suppression as we see here in vivo. It's harder to record in the dentate <coughs> slices and so there are far less studies that looked at the effects of stress on LTP in the dentate gyrus. Uh, we looked at it in vivo and we found the opposite effect. So introducing the same stress, uh, I'm sorry, the same activation of the uh, amygdala uh, led to increased level of, of uh, LTP in dentate gyrus of the hippocampus as opposed to the suppression that we saw in uh, C1. And in a similar fashion, we found also that the exposure to stress, in this case the water stress, so that people refer to the water maze as a learning task. But in fact, when you introduce the animal to the water, firstly, it induces a level of stress in these uh, animals. And Again, we found, just like with the activation of the amygdala, that this exposure to stress suppresses LTP in C1, as was found in, by many researchers in many laboratories, but enhances it in the, uh, in the density gyrus. What, what, what is naive? What is the meaning of naive? It's not in the waterways? Or it yes, naive is uh, it was not exposed. Uh, platform was exposed controllably, and uh, no platform without control. Yes, this is so there's no post exposure. There's no anxiety or stress involved when the animal anesthetizes unconscious. Yes. Uh, well, well. Change the hippocampus, as it were. Yes. Um, so these and similar studies have led us to uh, conclude that indeed um, stress and amygdala activation induce similar effects on the. Uh, hippocampus, and they, these similar effects actually are uh, region-specific so that um, if you think about it, at the same time, an animal that is exposed to stress does not have an impact of suppression of memory or enhancement of memory, but actually a change in what exactly is the system that actually acquires the experience. 
in a way. And, and uh, but um, you have a combination of enhancing of memory of some aspect of the experience and suppressing of other aspects of the same uh, experience. And this led us to think that we have something that may be relevant to PTSD because in post-traumatic stress disorder, this is the picture that you have, that people that were exposed to a very traumatic experience normally would have a very strong emotional memory of some aspects of the experience, normally a very irrelevant aspects of the experience, but uh, they would have uh, actually impaired memory or even amnesia of uh, other aspects of, of the same, uh, same uh, experience. Is it not because of focus? It's, I think it's because of a combination of, of uh, mechanisms. But first of all, you have, because until then, it was like, there were people who were talking about enhancing effects of emotionality and stress and people that were talking about suppressing effects. And in fact, it happens in the same individual. And that's, that's the thing. So there are several mechanisms, that, uh, uh, processes that take place. Uh, one of them would be narrowing of, of uh, focus to an extreme under um, traumatic experiences. So we'll come back to PTSD in a moment, but we have to... Uh, remember that not every stressful experience is actually a uh, traumatic experience. Although we see a lot that people refer to um, emotional and stressful experiences as being traumatic or as being relevant to PTSD, in fact, um, we are exposed to many small stressors during the day and our system is built to adapt to or to cope with these uh, uh, processes. And uh, under some conditions, this may be uh, a higher level or a lower level of, of stress. And under some conditions, some people may be exposed to such a <coughs> severe stressor that they may develop some pathology that is uh, associated with that. And you could assume that under these different uh, conditions, the way the amygdala would interact with the hippocampus would be different. And may be even that some of the mechanisms for why we respond differently after different levels of uh, emotionality and stress is because the amygdala is activated to a uh, different uh, level. And in order to, to test this, we decided, uh, this is just to say that, uh, we also have evidence that if you expose animals to different levels of emotionality, stress, or trauma, you get different levels of activation of the amygdala. And again, this is an example from our lab looking at the activation as is expressed by level of phosphorylation of Krebs, but this has been something that has been shown by several laboratories. The fact that uh, the level of uh, emotionality or stress may lead to different levels of activation of the amygdala. The question is whether this is functionally different in terms of what it does to the hippocampus. And to do that, we used different patterns of uh, activation of the amygdala and asked whether this makes any difference in terms of the effect on the uh, uh, priming of the amygdala on LTP in the uh, hippocampus. And here, when I talk about the parameters, I'm not talking about the parameters that are used to induce the LTP, but the parameters that are used to activate the amygdala. Okay, so the differences are in the amygdala. We always use the same protocol for trying to induce LTP in the uh, hippocampus. So here, for example, we use different uh, frequencies to activate the, uh, the uh, basal amygdala. And as you can see, the, most of these protocols have led to uh, suppression of LTP in C1. Uh, in this case, this is 30, uh, up to 30 seconds to the uh, high-frequency stimulation. So, so that uh, you run this protocol and you end 30 seconds before and then you... How long is the protocol? The protocol, it depends on the, the frequencies, actually. You have those that uh, are very brief. Uh, and um, the 1 hertz 900 uh, takes several minutes. It, it depends on the protocol that you use. 
this is like a protocol. It's the number the, here. The number of pulses were 100 pulses. Uh, same number of pulses at different frequencies. On another experiment, we tried to use different uh, pulses uh, with different number of, of uh, pulses. But in this case, it's the same. It's the same number of pulses, but the frequencies that are delivered are, is different. So it takes a different uh, time. And it doesn't matter in the C1 because it leads to suppression. Whereas in the Dante gyrus, we got a much more complex. Uh, picture where some of the protocols led to enhancement of uh, LTP, as I've, I've shown you before, and some have led to a reduction in uh, in the level of LTP that was uh, uh, achieved. And this is very much like what you would find if you look in the literature to the effects of uh, stress on LTP in these two different regions, so that regardless of the type of stressor and the exact protocol of stress that they were using, uh, studies that talk about LTP and CA1 talk about suppression of LTP. And you have, I think the first paper was in uh, 1987 or something like this. Since then, there have been many laboratories that have done this. There are much fewer uh, studies that were published on effects of stress on LTP in the dentate gyrus, but there are several, and they go from enhancement to suppression to no effect, depending on the exact protocol that, that uh, was used. So again, there's a similarity between the effects of stress and, and uh, the effects of activation of the amygdala in that uh, respect. But this suggests another thing, which uh, to me looks interesting. And this is that under emotionality or stressful conditions, in fact, uh, CA1, which is normally is more in the focus of attention in models of uh, trying to explain how the hippocampus works, because this is kind of the more computational part of the hippocampus, whereas the dentate gyrus is normally considered to be kind of a gating area. CA1 is very monotonous. So stress reduces plasticity in this area. It doesn't matter exactly what, you, what kind of stress, what protocol you use, and so on. Whereas what defines the outcome, in a way, is what happens in the dentate gyrus. So that if under maybe more relaxed conditions, it is the C1 and what happens in C1, C3, C1, that is uh, more important, it may be that under more emotional, or the more emotional you go, it is what happens in the dead age gyrus that would define the outcome. And in that respect, we also measured the level of uh, circulating corticosterone after stimulating the amygdala and, uh, with using the different protocols, because stimulation of the uh, amygdala also leads to activation of the HPA axis and release of corticosterone. And we found that the different patterns of stimulation of the amygdala leads to different levels of, of circulating corticosterone. It always leads to some, to some uh, elevation as compared to the control, but the different level of uh, elevation. And those two protocols that lead to the highest level actually led to the highest increase in LTP and the dentate gyrus. They have no effect, no different effect on, in a CA1. So you get uh, no correlation between the level of uh, court and the level of LTP in CA1, but a very nice correlation uh, with regards to the uh, dente gyrus, again suggesting that under these emotional or stressful conditions, it is very much important what happens in the dentate as to what would be the outcome. So, we wanted to uh, focus on the dente gyrus and see what happens under conditions that we know that activate the, uh, the uh, amygdala. And we were also interested, as I mentioned, in post-traumatic stress disorder. And we wanted, because of that, to work on an animal model of, of PTSD. Now, animal models of PTSD have been influenced by the thinking about the pathology. <coughs> 
And the, the most significant characteristic of PTSD is the exposure to the trauma. This is also the first criterion to be uh, diagnosed as uh, suffering from, from uh, PTSD. And this has influenced the thinking about the models so that different laboratories, including our, our laboratory, focused for a long time on what would be an experience that is relevant to the rat or the mouse and that would lead in it to something like PTSD. What would be an effective trauma that would be uh, intuitive to the animal and would lead to such a traumatic experience? However, we actually know that most people who would be exposed to a traumatic experience, and it doesn't matter what traumatic experience we talk about, would not develop PTSD. In fact, they talk about normally 10%, 50% of the people that were exposed. If you talk about uh, 30%, it's already a very high percentage of, of uh, exposed uh, people that would develop PTSD, which means that 70% of the people, even under very traumatic experiences, would not develop PTSD. This means that the exposure to the traumatic experience is actually not a sufficient condition to induce PTSD. The trauma does not produce PTSD. It only produces PTSD if it is associated with some additional factors. And so it may be very important to think about and explore what could be these other factors. <coughs> Bless you. And, and this should be also incorporated into our animal models. Because think about it for a moment. If I have an animal model that I introduce an experience and 100% of the animals show something, there's something wrong in the model. It's not what happens in a, in a human case. One of the risk factors that uh, is mentioned uh, a lot in the psychiatric literature are uh, aversive experiences in, uh, in childhood that are considered to be a risk factor for developing PTSD or depression uh, later in life. And we decided to try and use this to gain both a validation of this claim so that to demonstrate that uh, indeed the exposure in childhood leads to uh, higher risk of PTSD uh, later in life, and to gain a better animal model. Because then we could use this to set up a model that a higher percentage of the animals can be expected to be affected in, a, in adulthood. Uh, so the idea was very simple, to expose the animals in childhood to some stressors, and then to leave them to adulthood and test them in adulthood as to how they cope with uh, stressful experiences in adulthood with the expectation that the response to stress in adulthood would be uh, more severe if they are exposed to it on the background of this previous uh, exposure. There was a matter of what is childhood in, uh, in rats and mice because most of the studies that were carried on early life experiences in rats and mice were actually working on very early period of the animal when there are very, well, there are still pups and there are actually born premature compared to human uh, infants. And so we decided to move to uh, a later early period, the post screening pre-puberty or early adolescence or juvenility, that uh, holds greater similarity to childhood as, as we think about it. And I will not uh, present here detailed uh, results of that because this has been Public. I'll just give you one, one uh, example where we expose the animals to the protocol of the juvenile stress. We have been playing with this protocol and uh, there's nothing sacred about this specific protocol actually. It's more about the dates that you expose the animals. Uh, but at some point we decided to focus on a certain protocol so that different students would run the same protocol 
And so this is what we do at around the age of one month, as you can see, 27 to 29 uh, days. And then the animals are left until uh, adulthood. And then they are exposed to a protocol, a traumatic protocol that we call the underwater trauma, which is a very simple and effective uh, protocol. Um, and then uh, one month later, again, we wait one month so that it would fit to the human, actually, time scale of PTSD. Also, although, of course, we don't know exactly. Uh, it could be that two days in a rat would be equal to, to a month, but nevertheless, we waited for a long time so that it would be relevant to PTSD. The protocol is just actually pushing the animal uh, underwater or restraining the animal underwater for, for uh, 30 uh, seconds. And uh, it is uh, supposed to be uh, something that is uh, intuitive to the animal on the one hand and to uh, uh, model a brief and uh, intense uh, traumatic experience, like a blast or something like this. And, okay, we've seen that. And uh, uh, what you can see here is uh, measures that were taken one month later. You can see here that although there is an effect of just being exposed to the trauma um, compared to animals that were not exposed to the uh, trauma, there's a far more significant impact of the trauma if this was introduced on the background of uh, this experience in, in uh, juvenility or early adolescence. Another thing that we've done with these animals was to test how, following exposure to this uh, juvenile stress, how they can uh, learn under stress in adulthood. And for this, we use the two-way shuttle avoidance task, which is a very convenient uh, task in this respect, um, where animal, it, it is like uh, classical free conditioning. You have a uh, tone and you have uh, a following uh, food shock, but as opposed to the regular free conditioning task here, the animal can do something about the situation so that they can actually move to the other compartment either when the shock is presented so that they can escape the shock and reduce the duration of the shock or um, when when they learn the association between the uh, tone and the shock, they can move already when the tone is presented so that they avoid the shock altogether. This is avoidance. And there is no safe side so that the animals, it's not a simple task. The animals cannot learn that there is one side that is safe. They have to learn actually that the principle is shuttling, is moving to the other compartment, despite the fact that actually they move to compartments that they have received shocks in. Okay, because they have to understand, and this is not easy without stress, and it's probably even more uh, difficult to grasp under stress. But animals normally learn to, to do that, and juvenile stressed animals, when tested in adulthood, are impaired in this, in this uh, uh, learning. So... This has convinced us that we have an effective uh, animal model, and as I said, there is much more to the characterization of the animal model that has been uh, published, but we now wanted to use this model to try and learn about the possible mechanisms that contribute to this, uh, to this effect. And for several reasons, we've started to look at um, GABA and GABAergic modulation of uh, excitatory activity in the hippocampus, mainly in the dente gyrus, of course. And one of the things we, we looked at was GABA-A receptor subunits, because we were not looking for a situation where there's a total uh, reduction in inhibition or, or enhancement of inhibition as such, but actually to the subtle changes in the modulation of activity. So can I talk for a moment? Yes. This one? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're referring the difference between the blue and the red to learning. Is it possible that it has nothing to do with learning? It has to do with how strong the shock is, how painful the shock is. Because uh, of the early experience, the shock is not so painful, so they, they don't care so much. We, 
when I showed you the, the protocol that we use for, for uh, juvenile stress, we actually started with one of the days being exposed to shocks, and then we were asked whether they, there's some association with the fact that they were previously exposed to this. And then we tested uh, the response to uh, food shock, the threshold for response, and this was not changed. Now, this is not a very sensitive uh, measurement, but at least to that level, I can say that this is not it's not a problem. It still could be something that is not directly related to learning mechanisms. It could be motivational, it could be uh, attentional because of the level of stress they are in, and the result is the poor performance. You accept the caveat. Yes. yes. Um, so, uh, again, we looked at the uh, those changes that could lead to subtle changes in the in the functioning of the GABAergic modulation, but not to uh, very major uh, changes, because uh, there is no reason to assume that there are such major changes. And one one possibility is a change in the uh, composition of subunits of the receptors, because the GABA A subunit, uh, the GABA A receptor is uh, is uh, made of several subunits. And it has been suggested that different subunits are actually um, uh, more sensitive and more relevant to different aspects of uh, behavior and in different interactions with different drugs. And there is a kind of a developmental profile to, to the subunit uh, composition such that uh, GABA A alpha 1 has lower level of expression uh, in uh, juvenility and it increases into adulthood and the opposite with alpha 2, 3, and 5, for example, where they are higher in juvenility and they go down. Um, so that we, we um, looked at the possibility that this might be changed following the exposure to uh, juvenile stress. So again, the animals were exposed to the uh, stressors left to adulthood, and then we tested uh, their behavior following just exposure to juvenile stress or to juvenile stress with an emotional uh, challenge. And as you can see uh, here, there, there was a significant reduction in alpha-1 and significant increase in alpha-2 in the, in the uh, hippocampus. This was not specific to the dentate um, uh, of these uh, subunits. And this actually kind of seemed to be uh, as the state in juvenility. So it kind of reverses to the state of uh, juvenility. However, the problem with the, with the GABA neuromodulation is that it actually involves uh, a large variety of different interneurons. And the question is whether you can study it in greater detail to see what exactly happens within this, uh, what we call local circuit. And I'll say uh, a brief word. Until what time? Uh, you have 15 more minutes. You have 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, so that uh, briefly I will explain uh, what we refer to as when we talk about local circuit activity, but it's quite clear. You know that HAB has coined the idea of, of the, that memory is, is a, is uh, captured in the change in the efficacy of connections between uh, cells, synapses, and in fact, long-term potentiation as a model of synaptic plasticity uh, was actually looking for demonstration of such uh, principles to show that indeed you can uh, change the efficacy of communication uh, between uh, cells. However, in most cases, LTP is studied by stimulating the incoming fibers to a region, the incoming excitatory fibers to the region, and so that the change that you can see is of the uh, efficacy of these incoming fibers to activate the cells in the, in the principal cells normally in the, in the region. And if you think about it, it falsely <coughs> portrays a picture where what, what happens uh, when the animal learns something is that um, information is uh, moved from one region to another in greater efficacy, which is, of course, not what is uh, 
what is uh, meant by these uh, studies, but uh, the idea is that when the information comes to, arrives to a region, it then meets a local circuit of interactions between these principal cells, which are responsible for receiving the information and sending out the information, and the local, mostly inhibitory, GABAergic interneurons that pro uh, actually um, compose a kind of a computational circuit that is supposed to um, process the information in such a way that the information that came in would be somehow different from the information that would be sent later on, depending on the processing. Which means that in addition to changes that may be related to memory formation in the incoming synapses to the region, you could expect that there would be also changes in these interactions that would be very relevant to the uh, computational properties of this uh, circuit, and probably relevant to the way this circuit would function after uh, different experiences. The question is, how do you study those interactions, and particularly, how do you study those in vivo? Because these are complex interactions, and it turns out that there are several protocols, particularly in the dentin gyrus, there are several relatively simple electrophysiological protocols that enable you to study those. And, uh, for example, commissural uh, activation, so you stimulate the contralateral dentin gyrus, you activate the commissural pathway that activates interneurons, and then trying to activate the response of the principal cells in the ipsilateral dentin gyrus, you get suppression of the response mainly at the component that is called population spike. And this is considered to reflect some kind of feedforward inhibition. Another protocol which is very simple is just stimulating twice in a short interval because the activation of the principal cells in the first, uh, with the first uh, stimulus also activates some feedback uh, loop which activates interneurons and then when you come back to try and activate it again you are under the effect of some kind of feedback inhibitory uh, influence and the one that I like the most is uh, frequency dependent inhibition where all you do is change the frequency of stimulation from, from uh, 0.1 hertz that we normally use to 1 hertz for a brief time. Normally we use 10 pulses. And then it's very nice. The population spike uh, reduces its size. And as soon as you go back to 0.1 hertz, it goes back and you can play with it like this. It's very nice to see. Uh, and uh, each of these protocols actually is reflected in changes in the population spike, but actually is based on activating different aspects of, of those interactions. It's not a direct measure of anything in this circuit, but it's a reflection of different aspects of this uh, circuit. And this is the first step. First, we wanted to see whether stress affects such, uh, such uh, uh, parameters at all. And as it happened, we were the first to look at this, and we just exposed animals to a very trivial stress protocol, forced swim stress. These are adult animals exposed to a forced swim, and we looked at frequency-dependent inhibition first because, as I told you, this is the one that I like the most, and there was no effect. But when we looked at, in the same animals, actually, in a commissure-induced uh, modulation, we found that there is a very strong effect, uh, strong enhancement of inhibition of this type um, following the exposure to, to the uh, stress. But what we were mostly interested in were whether the exposure to these juvenile stress have long-term effects on such, such uh, protocols. So we expose animals to these uh, juvenile stress, and then in adulthood, we measure these uh, protocols. And we found that frequency-dependent inhibition was not affected. This is now adult animals that were exposed uh, more than a month before to this uh, stress. Commissure induced uh, inhibition. Same, Same kind of stress? No, this is this protocol. This protocol, the juvenile stress protocol that has led previously what I've shown to, to um, uh, all the. What kind of stresses during juvenile time? This is the protocol that what we use. What kind of stresses 
three days of stressors, different stressors each day, but I can tell you that, in fact, when we started, we, we tested different things, and I cannot report any importance of using three same uh, stressors for three days, using just two days, uh, using uh, uh, different stressors than, than are uh, listed here. We didn't find any, any um, uh, importance to this, but if you shift and you stress one week later, this makes a difference. So the period is more relevant than the exact uh, stressor. Um, so commissure induced inhibition, there may be a trend here, but it was not uh, significant for enhanced uh, inhibition. The lower the bar is, the stronger the inhibition. But with paired pulse inhibition, we found a very strong effect of enhancement of the uh, inhibition uh, here. Now the problem is, as I told you, that this is a very indirect measure, actually, of what happens. It shows you one thing. It shows you that this is not an overall effect on inhibition or excitation. This is a specific effect which suggests that only subsets of interneurons are sensitive to the exposure to stress. And maybe different subsets of interneurons are, are sensitive to different protocols of stress which may lead to what we've seen with the dente gyrus, that different protocols of stress lead to different outcomes. And it fits to the idea that was uh, suggested by Thomas Freund uh, in uh, 2003 that suggested that there may be subsets of interneurons that are not plastic at all because these are pacemakers and, and uh, they cannot change because they would change the time perception. And uh, there are those interneurons that are very plastic that receive a lot of neuromodulatory inputs on them and they may be very plastic and maybe abnormal activity of those may be involved in anxiety and depression and other psychiatric uh, disorders. So this fits to this uh, idea that you would have a specific effect of specific interneurons, but using just these uh, field potential recordings in, in, in vivo would not lead to the uh, identification of, these, uh, of the exact sets of uh, neurons that are involved. And you have to think about ways of going more specifically. One way is to move from in vivo to in vitro and recording specifically in uh, interneurons, which we try to actually do in, in as, as a collaboration with people who record uh, in vitro, although there are many people are reluctant to record from in interneurons because they are more difficult to record than, than principal cells. But another way is to try and manipulate specific molecules that would be specific to the subset of interneurons and uh, then to see what impact this may have. And interneurons have been characterized in the hippocampus, in the cortex, um, to have several different molecules that are associated with them. For example, um, uh, neuropeptides, because most of the interneurons have uh, GABA, but also co-localized with GABA, they have different uh, neuropeptides, and these are specific to specific subpopulations of interneurons. And you could imagine that if you address those, you may affect the, the functioning of specific uh, interneurons in uh, such a way. Um, so this is a, a direction, but what I will report here is actually something that uh, happened by chance. We, we were working on a different project with, uh, with uh, Hans uh, Jorgen Volkmer from, from uh, Tübingen and I was uh, twice lucky. First of all because he's really a very nice person and it's uh, great fun to work with him. And secondly because we were working on some cell adhesion molecules and one of the molecules that we were working on is uh, neurofacin and they found that neurofacin in interaction with jefferin is associated with clustering of GABA A receptors. And specifically with clustering of GABA A receptors in the axon initial segment. And this means that if you affect the expression of uh, neurofacin in the dente gyrus, you affect only the ability of interneurons that uh, 
target this area of the neuron to modulate the activity. You do not affect interneurons in general. You do not affect uh, GABA receptors in general. You affect only this area, which is, uh, is a critical uh, area, but uh, only this area and only the functioning of interneurons that are uh, affecting this area. So we decided to see whether we would be lucky and this would have some kind of a specific effect. And what we did was to actually inject a viral vector that reduces the expression of neurofacin into the dentate gyrus in juvenility. So instead of exposing animals to the juvenile stress, we just injected this virus, waited to adulthood, tested these animals, and it, the picture that we saw at the level of the field potentials was very similar to what we saw uh, with, the, um, with the juvenile stress, so that there was a specific enhancement of paired pulse uh, inhibition. Furthermore, testing these animals behaviorally, we found that these were also impaired uh, in the two-way uh, shuttle uh, avoidance task. So, suggest some uh, similarity here. This is, of course, just the, the beginning of, uh, of a journey where, as I said, we plan to use other viruses. And just as an example, we talked about GABA subunit. We also we found an elevation of alpha-2 subunit in these uh, protocols and just happened to have the virus that reduces the alpha-2 expression, so we decided to test this as well in the same uh, way. And what we found was that frequency-dependent inhibition, finally frequency-dependent inhibition, that uh, uh, was the protocol I liked so much and was not affected by stress, was actually, uh, we found the opposite effect, the reduction in inhibition with injecting uh, this, uh, this uh, virus. And this actually is the picture that you get when you induce LTP. If you apply high-frequency stimulation and you measure frequency-dependent inhibition, you find that this change also occurs just the same uh, way. So this is like inducing plasticity leads to this, or learning may induce this. And we have not yet uh, tested these animals in the two-way shuttle avoidance. This is now tested, but testing them in another test, which is also considered to involve the hippocampus, so it's not completely hippocampus dependent task. We also saw an elevation in performance in object, uh, new object uh, recognition uh, task, which uh, again suggests some improvement in performance rather than uh, impairment as we've seen with the neurophasing. So this is just the beginning of, uh, of a journey, and if I would summarize what I was trying to show here, I showed you that stress and trauma modulate activity in the amygdala and that the amygdala modulates activity and plasticity in the hippocampus. The amygdala induces combination of memory enhancing and memory suppressing effects. And this may explain the complex effects of stress and trauma on different aspects of uh, memory because it happens in the same person or the same animal. It's not like separate effects that happen in different animals. The amygdala itself is uh, subjected to experience-induced plasticity leading to changes in the way the amygdala modulates activity and plasticity. And this happens in relation mainly to the dentate gyrus. The impact of this is more in the dentate gyrus than on, on, on uh, the classical CA1, uh, C3 areas, which suggests that the involvement of this area becomes more relevant, or the role of this area becomes more relevant under more emotional conditions. And stressful traumatic, uh, or traumatic experiences are associated with alterations in GABA activation and uh, exhibit alterations in GABAergic functioning in the hippocampus, which involve only subsets of those processes, probably only subsets of interneurons. And understanding those may enable us to think about very selective ways of uh, intervention uh, later on. And these are the people that actually were involved in doing this uh, work. And thank you very much.
we have uh, we have several um, evidence lines of evidence that the amygdala and the dente gyrus are more related than change in the same direction uh, we, uh, in exposure to stress and uh, trauma, and C C1 and prefrontal cortex are like uh, more affected in a, in a different way, in a similar way, so that it <coughs> suggests that there is a kind of a shift from one system that works maybe under lower level of uh, stress, and uh, uh, there's a shift to a different system that may be related to the concept that when you learn other emotionality, you learn uh, more details and you have a better uh, detailed memory of the experience, whereas if you move to higher level and higher level of, uh, of stress, you would get to uh, simplified uh, just uh, uh, concept of the experience but it's a, it's a stronger it's a stronger memory. And this would be the case of the dentagyrus. Yes, that the dentagyrus would, and it fits also to the idea that in fact you can have more details if you use the C1 C3 system. But but uh, you may have less details, but it would induce a stronger uh, memory in the end if you if you rely more on the on the uh, dentagyrus. And it is important to say that this. The, it's not a complete blockade or exclusion of C1. It's a balance or, or ratio of involvement. So in three conditioning, uh, three conditioning is not uh, a good enough description because three conditioning can be used in different using different uh, intensities, and, uh, for example, and it has been shown that if you use the regular the regular uh, intensity that people use, like uh, Point uh, four or five, point eight milliamp uh, to stimulate the animals. This is a, a stressful experience, but it's not a traumatic uh, experience. And then you would expect, actually, uh, uh, that learning would be uh, quite effective. Whereas if you go uh, higher with the stimulus intensity, and you may get to where either it's very painful <laughs> or but somehow it becomes more more traumatic to the to the animal. You may get involvement of somewhat different areas uh, becoming more more important, and the outcome memory uh, different. The problem is that whatever people use to induce the fear conditioning, the use to the test is is similar and is very is very monotonous. So that if you only test the response to the context or the the tone, you may miss the difference in the quality of the memory that has been formed. Yes? Um, what happens to, um, to animals that you just take away their amygdala? Um, like, um, if you had an animal that you would like to see how the animal is processing the stress but with an amygdala, then what would you... First of all, all those effects on, on the hippocampus, stress effects on the hippocampus, are much reduced if you exclude the uh, amygdala. This has been shown. If so if you uh, either lesion the amygdala or temporarily inactivate the amygdala, you do not see such suppression of uh, LTP. You do not see the effects of suppression of learning, the hippocampus-dependent learning, and so on. Um, so that. And you do not even see, for example, there has been uh, experiments where they injected uh, some neuromodulators or, or uh, hormones to the hippocampus directly, uh, which had an effect in an intact animal and uh, lost much of the effect if you actually ex uh, take out the uh, amygdala. So it's a system that uh, works. Animals that have no amygdala do not show fear. Do not, uh, I mean, they... they uh, and. Uh, and um, do not show response to stress. It's, uh, or if you inactivate the amygdala, you have reduced response to stressful experiences. Does it show anger? Interesting. Does it show aggression? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. It's the same truth 
uh, my understanding was that juvenile stress changed something in this campus. So if you apply juvenile stress, a couple days later took the amygdala out, the campus would still have undergone the change. You would still see it. Um, I don't. I don't know how much uh, how much of the change um, that you induce in the uh, juvenile with the juvenile exposure is uh, dependent on something that happens in the amygdala and awaits to the uh, abnormal modulation of what happens in the hippocampus in adulthood and what is transferred immediately to the hippocampus. What we have done, and actually I've seen here, I've shown here in the, for example, the changes subunit, is that there are some changes that occur in the amygdala immediately. If you take the, and we've done this, you can see it immediately in the amygdala. But there are some changes that if you look in the hippocampus, they would not occur, in a, you do not see them in, even in an adult animal uh, if you do not challenge the animal. So that it's like there is some kind of metaplasticity that takes place in the amygdala and awaits for a challenge to the hippocampus before it expresses itself on the hippocampus. So I would assume that if you take out the amygdala, we have not done that. But based on this, I would assume that if you take out the amygdala after you have introduced the juvenile stress, and then you would uh, test these animals, you would not see the effects of juvenile stress as you see with the intercanimic uh, But this has not been tested. <laughs>